Welcome to the Newman Center Catholic Mission and Holy Rosary Roman Catholic Church's joint webinar, Navigating Reconciliation Together. My name is Father Mark Kolosowski, and I am the pastor of the Newman Center here in Toronto. We are so thrilled with the response from our community as we have many attendees watching and many who are eager to watch the recording of this dialogue. I welcome you to ask questions below in the dashboard's Q&A box. I will open the talk with our opening prayer and uh, later a land acknowledgement. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord Heavenly Father, together we pray for the children who died in residential schools throughout Canada, and for all those who continue on a journey through the darkness, that there may be healing founded on truth and that the Spirit will inspire our ongoing commitment to reconciliation. God, through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, continue to offer us correction uh, so that your grace might change and transform us in our weakness and repentance. Give us humility to listen when others reveal how, they have, how we have failed and, failed and courage to love others as ourselves. Mindful of your love, for the weakest and most vulnerable among us. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. We acknowledge the land we are meeting on in this traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And it is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And now, uh, let us welcome our speakers. Graydon Nichols. The Honorable Graydon Nichols, Order of New Brunswick, was the 30th Lieutenant Governor of New Brunswick from 2009 to 2014. Becoming the first Aboriginal person to hold this office, he was born on the Tobique Reserve in, in 1946 and as a member of the Wolastokoi Nation. He earned a BC's degree in 1968, an LLBA and an MSW in 1974. He was appointed as provincial court judge from 1991 to 2009. He worked with the Union of New Brunswick Indians as legal counsel, chairman of the board and president of the Union of New Brunswick Indians from 1974 to 1988. He is married to his wife, Beth, on June 28th, 1969, and has two sons, Michael and Brian. Michael died on August 9th, 2019. Beth and Graydon are members of the Christian Life Community, CLC, since 1984. He is a firm believer of prayerful discernment to, to find out God's plan in his life. He joined the Knights of Columbus in 2009. He was a participant at Our Lady of Guadalupe Congress in 2009 and 2012 at the Supreme Conventions. He was elected as a Supreme Director in Philadelphia in 2019 for a three-year term. Graydon was appointed uh, to the Endowed Chair of Native Studies on August 1st, 2015 at St. Thomas University. He is involved with teaching, research, and community interaction. He is a recipient of the Order of Canada on May 2016. He was appointed to the Guadalupe Circle of the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops in December 2016 to represent the Knights of Columbus. He was appointed as an independent member of the GIO, General Insurance Ombud Service, for a three-year term on October 17th and appointed as chair on October 2021. He was appointed an honorary colonel for the 3rd Field Regiment Loyal 
on June 20th, 2019 for a three-year term. He was installed as Chancellor of St. Thomas University on May 11th, 2021 for a term of four years. We welcome you, uh, Graydon and Nichols, um, to this webinar. Thank you for being here. We also have with us Maria Lucas. Maria Lucas is a Black Métis woman whose heritage inspired her to study Indigenous crown relations in a historical and political context in her undergraduate degree, which she completed at the University of Toronto. In her studies, Maria discovered the unique legal framework that informs Indigenous people's relationship with the crown, and she came to understand that the law is key to reconciling this relationship. As a result, she was prompted to pursue law school. She completed her Juris Doctorate at the University of Ottawa with a spe specialization in Aboriginal law and Indigenous legal traditions in April 2019. She was recently called to the Ontario Bar as a lawyer. Maria is also the co-founder and secretary of the Indigenous Catholic Research Fellowship. We welcome you, Maria. And Father Peter Taroni is here with us today as well. Father Peter Taroni, PhD, is the current pastor of Holy Rosary Parish in Toronto, Ontario. Prior to his current ministry, he served as pastor and executive director of the Newman Centre Catholic Mission for five years. Father Taroni is a priest for the Archdiocese of Toronto. He completed his undergraduate degree in psychology from York University and earned his master's and doctoral degrees in medical science and neuroscience at the University of Toronto. He completed his philosophy degree uh, through the Oratory of St. Philip Neri and later completed his theology degree at the Pontifical Urban University for missionaries in Rome. He worked as a missionary amongst the poor in the Mongolian desert for almost three years. He was ordained to the priesthood on September 1st, 2012. Thank you, uh, Father Peter, for also um, being here. I now invite Maria uh, to begin our uh, presentation. Good evening, everybody. And thank you for attending this webinar uh, this evening on uh, navigating a very important and complex topic of, of reconciliation. So I'm just going to share my screen because I do have a slideshow. Okay, so navigating reconciliation together. Uh, so just to give you an overview of the presentation this evening, you, we will be um, talking about the history and legacy of residential schools briefly um, to sort of ground the conversation. And then we'll be talking about church teaching on mission and enculturation uh, and how that was not adhered to consistently uh, in, in the history of residential schools. Um, we'll also be talking about different examples of enculturation in the Indigenous context, um, many of which predate uh, the residential school era. And then we'll be talking about reconciliation and how it's been defined by the TRC and what concrete actions are coming about um, going forward in terms of making reconciliation real. And then we'll be closing with a Q&A and a, a closing prayer. So first of all, just a note on terminology. So you probably have heard uh, different um, terms being used in relation to Indigenous peoples. Um, so there's Indian, there's Aboriginal. Uh, and I just wanted to note that those, those terms have specific legal meaning under the Indian Act and the Constitution Act of 1982, respectively, and that the term Indigenous is the preferred term um, to use. Uh, it contains a broader meaning as indicated by the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, in Article 33 Sub 1 of the UNDRIP states that Indigenous peoples have the right to determine their own identity or membership in accordance with their customs and traditions. And so what that 
highlights is that Indigenous peoples have the right to determine for themselves who they are, and they are not um, they are not to uh, have they don't have to adhere to imposed uh, definitions of, of Indigenous identity, colonially imposed definitions. And then the last uh, talk, uh, term that we'll be talking about this evening is culture. Um, and we've defined culture as um, something that indicates everything whereby the human person develops and perfects his or her many bodily and spiritual qualities. Okay, so history and legacy of residential schools. So the Truth uh, and Reconciliation Commission report, so a lot, um, uh, a lot of what I'll be speaking about tonight, a lot of the material comes from the TRC. So the TRC was formed out of the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, or the IRSA for short. Um, the IRSA was reached in 2006 and came to effect in 2007, and it was actually the largest class action uh, settlement in Canadian history, uh, and the parties to it were the uh, Canadian government um, involved in um, uh, it, constructing the residential school system, um, the various uh, Christian denominations that were involved in administering the system, and as well as um, various uh, residential school survivors. And as you can see, it's not just one report, but it is in, in different parts, sort of focusing on um, different aspects of, of, the, of this history. So contextualizing residential schools. So for over a century, Canada's Aboriginal policy aimed to eliminate Aboriginal governments, ignore Aboriginal rights, terminate the treaties, and through a process of assimilation, cause Aboriginal peoples to cease to exist as distinct legal, social, cultural, religious, and racial entities in Canada. The establishment and operation of residential schools was a central element of Canada's Aboriginal policy, which can best be described as cultural genocide. So residential schools wasn't just a one-off sort of policy that the Canadian government um, implemented, but it was a, a part of the greater sort of colonial project. So as the, T, the TRC found um, throughout uh, about five plus years of research, um, and it concluded after speaking with residential school survivors across the country, that really the system was um, amounted to cultural genocide. And so what is cultural genocide? Cultural genocide is the destruction of those structures and practices that allow the group to continue as a group. States that engage in cultural genocide set out to destroy the political and social institutions of the targeted group. Families are disrupted to prevent the transmission of cultural values, identity from one generation to the next. So in a phrase, and you probably have heard this phrase, uh, quoted before, really the aim of the system was to kill the Indian in the child, but save, but save the child. So the residential school uh, system was a, a church state uh, endeavor. Um, the Roman Catholic, uh, Anglican, United, Methodist and Presbyterian churches were among the major Christian denominations involved in the administration of the residential school system. Uh, the government's partnership with the churches remained in place until um, 1969. And although most of the schools had closed by the 1980s, the last federally supported residential schools uh, remained in operation until the late uh, 1990s. Uh, the last one closed, I believe, in 1996. So statements from state and church leaders. Uh, and I wanted to uh, use these two uh, quotes just to kind of show what the thinking was. Um, in the time when residential schools were first um, sort of implemented post post confederation in 1867 and sort of the continuum of thought around um, assimilation of the indigenous child into the Euro Canadian body politic. So Canada's first prime minister, Sir Johnny MacDonald, uh, told the House of Commons in 1883 when the school is on the reserve, the child lives with its parents who are savages. He is surrounded by savages, and though he may learn to read and write, his habits and training and mode of thought are Indian. He is simply a savage who can read and write. It has been strongly pressed on myself, 
as the head of the department, that is the Department of Indian Affairs, that Indian children should be withdrawn as much as possible from the parental influence. And the only way to do that would be to put them in central training industrial schools where they will acquire the habits and modes of thought of white men. And then about 75 years later in 1958, senior oblate Andre Renaud echoed the words of Sir John A. Macdonald when commenting on students at day schools. He said, when they went back to their homes at the end of the school day, and for the weekend, the pupils are re-exposed to their native culture, however diluted from which the school is trying to separate them. A residential school, on the other hand, that is a boarding school, could surround its pupils almost 24 hours a day with non-Indian Canadian culture through radio, television, public address system, movies, books, newspapers, group activities, etc. And so again, this is just a highlight that the thought of assimilation um, of the Indigenous child into Euro-Canadian Christian quote-unquote society um, was the um, a, a thought and an attitude that had lasted through uh, the generations. So the residential school uh, environment, this sort of just highlights in a, in a very high level, from a very high level perspective, um, sort of the facts of what life was like, generally speaking, in the, in the school, in the schools, sorry. So for the children, life in residential schools has been described as lonely and alien. Buildings were poorly located, poorly built and poorly maintained. Staff was limited in numbers, often poorly trained and not adequately supervised. Diet was meager and of poor quality. Discipline was harsh and daily life was highly regimented. Indigenous languages and cultures were denigrated and suppressed. Educational goals of the schools were limited and confused and usually reflected a low regard for the intellectual capabilities of Indigenous people. Education and technical training too often gave way to the drudgery of doing the chores necessary to make the school self-sustaining. And child neglect was institutionalized and the lack of supervision created situations where students were prey to sex sexual and physical abusers. So while um, residential school survivors experience all kinds of abuse, and a lot of this is documented in a TRC um, volume um, uh, called, this, I believe it's called the Survivors Speak, um, where the they, various uh, residential school survivors tell their story um, of what they experienced. And uh, so I, I just took two, um, two uh, experiences uh, from, that, from that volume, one from Fred Brass and one from Elizabeth Papetier, um, because I thought that not to juxtapose these experiences, but I, I thought that in terms of religious training, and we're talking about sort of this, the church's involvement in this system, so in terms of religious training, um, the experiences of students was, was varied. Some had positive experiences and some had, had negative experiences. So Fred Brass, uh, he had a, a negative experience. He recalled a copy of Father Lacombe's uh, instructional ladder that hung at the end of the playroom of the Roman Catholic school in Camsack, Saskatchewan. He says, there was a picture of stairs and at the bottom of those stairs, was Indian people and there was fire. And above the stairs, there was Jesus and the angels. And that's what we were told. If we didn't change our ways, that's how we were going to end up. That's a picture that will always stay in my mind. So for other students, uh, religious education was one of the key benefits of residential schooling. Um, so Elizabeth Papetier said she valued her religious education. She said, I learned religion at a very early age. I learned about Christianity and I loved it. I love beautiful things. I love beauty. And so again, I wanted to um, highlight these uh, two experiences or just a sample of a very long um, volume of varied experiences to show that truth in this context um, means different things. So the legacy of residential schools. <clears throat> so residential schools cannot simply be uh, consigned to, to history. Um, it's the impacts of the system are quite 
uh, far reaching and widespread. And while I had just said that truth in this context is varied and means different things because of the different experiences that uh, the residential school survivors can now t um, tell. The, over the overall conclusion, it's, a keep, it's important to keep in mind that the overall conclusion of the TRC who did extended, extensive research into this history, its overall conclusion was still that this was cultural genocide. And that's important to keep in mind. And that's, that um, harm that was inflicted is, is reflected in, in the far reaching um, impacts of the system. So the legacy from the schools and the political and legal policies and mechanisms surrounding their history continue to this day. Uh, and it's reflected in the significant educational, income, health, and social disparities that exist between Indigenous people and other Canadians. Most Indigenous languages are critically endangered. There's a disproportionate, disproportionate apprehension of Indigenous children by child welfare agencies. It's important to note that um, former Senator Murray Sinclair, um, who was the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, he had said when the report was released that there is more Indigenous children in the child welfare system today than there ever was at the height of residential schools. And that's absolutely astonishing. It's not, it's indicative of this history. It's indicative of the negative impact that this history has had on Indigenous communities and families. There's also a disproportionate imprisonment and victimization of Indigenous people, and uh, that is reflected in the overrepresentation of Indigenous peoples in the, in the criminal justice system. Um, and that overrepresentation has gotten so severe that throughout the years, the Supreme Court of Canada has attempted to address it in um, two uh, uh, precedent setting cases of Gladu and Apili, which requires courts to take judicial notice of the unique circumstances of Indigenous offenders when, when sentencing them. Because in this history, the intergenerational trauma as a result of residential schools could, have, could play a, a role in um, an Indigenous offender's presence before a court. So church teaching and the residential school system. So the residential school system's purpose quite obviously was contrary to the church's teaching on human dignity, uh, subsidiarity, family, the, the act of taking children in some instances quite forcibly from their family and, and um, putting them for years on end into these schools that sought to break down who they were is contrary to both to human dignity and, and to our concept of subsidiarity, which um, advocates for uh, sort of like the, the a local form of governance and the most, to, to, um, the most local form of governance we have is the family. Uh, solidarity as well, and uh, inculturation, which we're going to talk about uh, in more detail uh, this evening. Um, because it is, we have this rich uh, Indigenous um, enculturation tradition within the church, and it doesn't seem like it was consist uh, consistently adhered to um, in this history. So I'm going to pass the mic over to uh, Father Peter, who will speak in more detail about um, church's teaching on enculturation and, and what it means. Thank you. I'm just going to share a few slides. Okay. You can hear me? Okay, very good. So thank you very much for that, Maria. It's, uh, it's very painful to hear and to see all of these things laid out concretely and how it doesn't square with what uh, John tells us, that God is love in his first letter. So we're gonna take a look briefly at the relationship between faith and culture, and then practical examples will be given by Graydon. Now, when we look at the, the final chapter of the gospel according to Matthew, we hear Jesus say, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the close of the age. So one of the words that sticks out, of course, is go. Right? So mission, simply defined, means to be sent. The church, as she understands herself and as the, pope, uh, the popes have reaffirmed, the church is missionary by her very nature. So in the same way that the second person of the Trinity is sent by God the Father into the world to save us from our sins and restore our relationship with him, Jesus sends us also, he says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. So we share in this mission. Again, what is it? Well, we've been entrusted to proclaim the good news to all people of all times and all cultures until his second coming. But what happened? Sometimes it's worked, other times it's failed miserably, as we've just heard. There's a difference between proposing the faith and imposing the faith. So how should mission be done? Well, quite simply, it should be done in love, especially in those aspects of the culture being attacked or under threat, right? So we're there to be able to help the people and to help them to come to know the dignity that they have and to do everything to defend it. Now, truth itself takes no one by force. And mission is the vehicle, it's meant to be the vehicle through which we are called again to propose it, not impose it. And this mission, as Benedict XVI said, as Cardinal, the mission is not the acquisition of people for their own sphere of domination, but as the passing on as a matter of obligation of something meant for everyone and of which everyone stood in need. So we start off by saying that everyone has a right to hear the proclamation of the gospel. But the gospel must be proclaimed the way Christ intended, the way, the way Christ intended. So what exactly do we need? Well, what is it that people need that across cultures and across time? Again, to reaffirm the fact that we're called to be saved from our sins. The reality is that our relationship with God, we're deeply loved by him, but our relationship has been wounded by sin. And it's through our baptism, through, through Christ, who is God's only begotten son, that we become his adopted sons and daughters. And we're in this new and dynamic relationship with the Trinity. And unfortunately, this has not always been respected. In Truth and Tolerance, Ratzinger speaks of this. And he says that the history of the worldwide mission is seen by many, not as a liberating truth and love, but to a great extent as the history of a process of alienation and domination by force. So now to go back to the idea of culture and what true enculturation is, we go to the first definition that Maria had proposed. So just to restate, everything whereby people develop and perfect their many bodily and spiritual qualities. And the entrance, as we were taught in the, back in the seminary in Rome, the entrance into a culture is language. The importance of languages, we heard how the languages are being endangered. That is the way that you communicate with the other. So not forcing, again, one language onto another, but seeking to understand it and to appropriate, right? to, to help them to, under, to explain in terms that are understandable to, the, to their receptive culture, what you intend. Uh, the experience in, in Mongolia was an interesting one because one of the priests there who was translating the, the Hail Mary translated it three times in the span of five years. So that it, it, in order to do that, you need to really immerse yourself in the culture. And listen, right, and to and to understand the symbols. So again, enculturation is um, is a means of intimate transformation of the authentic cultural values through their integration in Christianity and the insertion of Christianity in the various human cultures. Now, enculturation is a difficult process because it must in no way compromise the distinctiveness and the integrity of the Christian faith and its essential elements. That God exists, that God is one and three, and Christ is the second person of the Trinity, the Logos. He's the incarnate God, the Son of God. Now, how does, the pro how does enculturation take place? Well, as Cardinal Dallas says, the process of enculturation takes place from within the receptive culture, and it takes 
generations. And we're going to hear uh, Graydon present uh, of how this has taken place historically. Thank you. Well, well, first of all, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, as you know, uh, in my language, I'll say great and gakulo gilawa. In my language, I just said hello and how are you doing on such a beautiful uh, time. And I've been asked to uh, speak about enculturation in the indigenous context. And so uh, my good friend Maria will be helping me with the slides. So I'll go on with the first slide uh, that I want to share with you. And this is just an example then of how I will be making presentations on each of these areas of Our Lady Guadalupe and St. Juan Diego, uh, which refuted the doctrine of discovery. And secondly, of course, what happened here on the East Coast with Grand Chief Henri Mambertu, uh, who was Mi'kmaq uh, Grand Chief. And uh, next one after that will be Joseph Chihuahua, who is Huron in the uh, Midland area of Ontario. And, also St. Kateri de Kakawita, uh, and lastly, a reference to Rose Prince, a carrier uh, member in British Columbia. So the next slide then I just, and this, this image of Our Lady Guadalupe is what my wife and I have been closely uh, uh, tied to actually since 2005. And as many of you know, of course, Our Lady Guadalupe appeared first to St. Juan Diego uh, an indigenous man on the morning of December 9th, 1531, as he was on his way to the center of the city for mass. And then when and Our Lady appeared to him in the complexion of a mestizo, in other words, a combination of indigenous and Spanish woman. And she also spoke to St. Juan Diego in his indigenous language. And, uh, and of course, uh, she wanted Juan Diego to convince the bishop of the day Bishop Zamagera, that in fact, he should build a temple where the indigenous people there could go there and pray to Our Lady Guadalupe and she would bring them comfort. And of course, as we know, uh, December the 12th, 1531 is when we celebrate the feast day of Our Lady Guadalupe uh, because it was on that morning that she appeared to Juan Diego, not only like this, but also as he delivered the roses that he collected and gave them to the bishop because the bishop had asked for a sign. So miraculously, uh, the roses fell down as roses fell down on the tilma of Juan Diego. This is the beautiful image of Our Lady Guadalupe that appeared. And this is still in existence in the great basilica in Mexico City, for those of you who have been interested in making a pilgrimage there. Now, it was only in uh, July 31st, 2002, that Juan Diego actually was canonized as a saint. And at that particular canonization, uh, St. John Paul II, uh, actually on his, when he completed the World Youth Day uh, visit at Toronto that summer of 2002, he made his way down to Mexico City. And at the time of the canonization, this, these were his words. And I quote here, the beginning of evangelization with a vitality that surpassed all expectations. Christ's message through his mother, took up the central elements of the indigenous culture, purified them, and gave them the definitive sense of salvation. Consequently, Our Lady of Guadalupe and St. Juan Diego have a deep ecclesial and missionary meaning and are a model of perfect enculturated evangelization. So this was a very important moment on December the 9th to the 12th, 1531. And between 1531 and 15. 1541, there were millions of conversions into the Catholic faith uh, by, the, uh, by the indigenous people in that area of Mexico. So in the next slide, uh, I'll be giving another example of what I say about refuting the doctrine of discovery, because this has been one of the principles that uh, are informed to the public and the United Nations declarations on the rights of indigenous people that this is not a valid doctrine. But the doctrine of discovery related to the legal term terra nullis, which means no one's land, is usually taken to mean that ownership or sovereignty over land passed automatically to the European nation by virtue of their discovering it, irrespective of the presence of previous indigenous occupants. 
Our Lady of Guadalupe, however, refutes that doctrine of discovery by affirming the dignity of indigenous people when she, in fact, she appeared as an indigenous woman in 1531, such that in 1537, Pope Paul III issued this very powerful word at Sublimus Deus, defending the dignity and the rights of indigenous peoples. And this particular excerpt is from there, and so often this has been forgotten. And I'll just quote, the Indians are truly men, and not only capable of understanding the Catholic faith, but according to our information, they desire exceedingly to receive it. We define and declare that the said Indians and all other people who may later be discovered by Christians are by no means to be deprived of their liberty or the possession of their property, even though they be outside the faith of Jesus Christ, and that they may and should freely and legitimately enjoy their liberty and the possession of their property, nor should they be in any way enslaved should the contrary happen, it shall be no and of no effect. And this particular um, statement by Pope John Paul III was not accepted by the Christian king of Spain and the queen. And they kind of discouraged anybody with taking this particular message to the new world. But this was important because it was a recognition by the Catholic pontiff that in fact, indigenous people were human beings and had land rights. So in the next slide then, as we can see, uh, one of the first, and we've had a history of, uh, of evangelization in the Maritimes here since the year 16, 1610. And why 1610? Well, Chief Henry Member, who actually was baptized on July, on June the 24th, 1610, which is the feast of St. John the Baptist. And so the name Henri is Henry, it's in French, remember too, because he was baptized in Port Royal, which was where the Fort Settlement was located, and the French uh, recollects were there. And of course, that's in present day Nova Scotia. But one of the things that Chief Member to agreed to become baptized, he wanted to have the French uh, to learn the Mi'kmaq language and go to the different Mi'kmaq communities and explain to them what he found out, what he was told, that Jesus is, the, is a man of faith. Jesus is also indigenous. And that's what these early missionaries taught the people. So from the very beginning, you see, they would say, when did Jesus become a Mi'kmaq? When did Jesus become a Wilstabwee? Those were the words that were taught to our ancestors. And so this is very important in terms of the enculturation, in terms of the early efforts of evangelization, such that the Mi'kmaq are the only tribe and nation that has a special relationship with the Vatican, and it's called the Mi'kmaq Concordat. And the other thing that the missionaries uh, told the, uh, in the teachings said, you know, Jesus uh, grand, had a grandmother, her name was St. Anne. So since that time in the 1600s, there has been deep devotion to the grandmother of Jesus, St. Anne, because the grandmother in the indigenous culture is very revered and very highly respected and passes on these teachings. And to this very day, uh, indigenous people gather at uh, St. Anne de Beaupre in, uh, outside of Quebec City annually on the third Sunday of June. So on the next slide then, as we can see, another area in Ontario, which is where you are, in a place called Midland, the, the, the Wandat or Huron nation was there. And this particular individual called Joseph Chiwatnawa. He met the Jesuits as early as 1636, and he actually was baptized on August the 16th, 1637, by St. John de Brieuf. Now, of course, we know as a saint. And Joseph, of course, helped the Jesuits to translate the hymns and prayers from French into Huron. And Joseph was so impressed with the spirituality of the Jesuits that he undertook the Ignatian spiritual exercise. And he was the very first person in Canada outside of the Jesuits to actually undertake the spiritual exercises. So he took his eight day silent retreat. And in that beautiful retreat, he had it composed a beautiful prayer. And I mentioned part of the thing in here, but this is what he said. And I quote, you love us so deeply that all I can do in return is to offer myself to you. I choose you as my elder and chief. There is no one else. You can see then the cultural connection that Jesus made on these early uh, encounters with the indigenous people. 
And unfortunately, Joseph himself was martyred on August 2nd, uh, 1640 at the age of 38. But this beautiful shrine at Midland, Ontario, I would encourage you, especially your people in Ontario, to go visit that because there's a full uh, representation of what occurred at that time. And he was also in Midland in 1984 that Pope John Paul II made part of his uh, visit there as well. So with the next slide now, the next, of course, probably more widely known across our land is St. Catherine de Cacahuita. And of course, we know that uh, St. Catherine as a child was born of a relationship uh, between the, an Algonquin woman and a Mohawk or Haudenosaunee um, man. And she was born in the year 1656. And she was drawn to the Jesuits in the way they prayed, in the way they worshiped. And so she started to take instructions. And of course, she was actually baptized on April 18, 1676, during Holy Week of, the, of that particular year. And she died, unfortunately, at a young age in 1680, at the age of 24. And her, her, her coffin and, and burial it was at Ganawaki uh, in uh, South Shore of Quebec. Of, of Quebec and such of Montreal. And her tomb is there. And, and while she was actually young, her mom and dad and her brothers died and she contracted smallpox. And so that made a, a mark on her face and there was the sort of like a poked face. But she was able to then bridge the two indigenous and Catholic identity through the sacraments that she received. And at the moment of her death, when she died, all of a sudden, the, the Jesuits who were there gathered with her, realized her complexion completely turned uh, well. She was good. And of course, many people have attributed uh, to her uh, healing. And of course, the, 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 one, the one miracle that brought her into sainthood in 2012 was this young indigenous young boy in um, in Washington State, who received the healing of, as a result of her intercession, and uh, my wife and I were very privileged to be at that canonization in October twenty first, two thousand and twelve. In the next slide, then uh, we'll see another story from the coast of British Columbia, well, from the province of British Columbia, and in uh, I was asked to go uh, participate in the Rose Prince pilgrimage by the uh, Bishop of, um, of, Fort, of, um, of, of where she's from. And, and she, as you can see her picture, she was born in 1915 and died in 1949, unfortunately after tuberculosis. But it was Bishop Jensen who invited me to come and speak that summer of 2018 to be, to be there and give sort of like a little bit of testimony of my own personal experience. And uh, she was, she went to the residential school in that area and in Fraser Lake, uh, it was Catholic run, Lejac residential school when she was only six years old and she never really left. When she reached the age of where she could leave, she decided to stay there because she was happy and her family actually agreed that yes, uh, she, if she's happy there, let her stay there as well. Unfortunately, one of the darkest chapters of that particular residential school is in 1937, when four boys uh, tried to escape and they fell into the particular Tully Ice at Fraser Lake and froze to death. And they cut, and at the time it was minus 29 degrees, which is pretty cold. And uh, so that was difficult, but she eventually herself, Rose Prince died at that school and, uh, and she was actually uh, buried and, and then a few years later, when they removed her, her coffin because they had to take her to a new, um, new cemetery, her, her co coffin cover came off. And as soon as it came off, they realized that she had not at all decayed. She was incorrupt and that they could still smell some of the smell of the roses that were buried with her in her coffin. And so, a lot of people now in that area uh, who come and participate in these Rosarines pilgrimage 
will tell you that they're drawn because of her uh, because of her way of life, her spirituality, and how she was comfortable with both indigenous and non-indigenous spirituality. It was a Catholic, and so uh, I was there, and I and I was just amazed. And when I saw people there from Washington State from British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, from Yellowknife, as well as Yukon, to come there in this particular time each year. And uh, so, like I said, I was privileged to be there, and I saw her particular beautiful um, place where she was buried and uh, the roses that are there. So, again, uh, uh, a wonderful experience of somebody who who in my, at least in my view, should, should be a saint. So the, the next slide, of course, is the one that I will conclude with, with in, again, indigenous culturation. But I'm quoting the words here actually of, of Pope John, St. John Paul II. Of course, as I said, he made his journey to Canada in, in 1984 as well as 1987. But here's what he said when he met the people in, um, when the faith was first preached among the native inhabitants of this land, the worthy traditions of the Indian tribes were strengthened and enriched by the gospel message. Your forefathers knew by instinct that the gospel, far from destroying their authentic values and customs, had the power to glorify and uplift the cultural heritage which they had received. Thus, not only is Christianity irrelevant to the Indian peoples, but Christ in the members of his body is himself Indian. Now the word they would use is probably indigenous. But you can see then how Pope John Paul II reinforced the early messages of Our Lady Guadalupe and then the early, uh, the, the early teachings of the uh, missionaries who came to Atlantic Canada, to Quebec, as well as to Ontario. How the, they said Christ is indigenous. And so this is what drew many of our people into the Catholic faith. Unfortunately and tragically, that is not what happened in residential schools because the government passed a special law supported by the churches that denied indigenous spirituality. And as, as Father Peter already indicated to you, you don't impose evangelization. You don't impose that you in fact try to convince people that Jesus is a man of peace. Jesus is one of us, each and every one of us. And that, that that's how we're drawn. And that's why Our Lady of Guadalupe then was so very, uh, such a wonderful evangelizer that she could draw millions and millions of people to follow her son, Jesus, who she said was a true God. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening to this, uh, I guess, to my comments, and I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you, Graydon. Um, so now I'm just going to move into the final portion of our webinar this evening, um, which is on reconciliation and exploring what that, what that means. I'm just going to share my screen here. Okay. So the TRC defines reconciliation as an ongoing process of establishing and maintaining respectful relationships. The TRC uh, actually issued 94 calls to action directed to various sectors of society to assist in, to assist in establishing and maintaining respectful relationships. Um, we don't have the time to go through all 94 calls to action, but I do encourage you to uh, check them out um, online. Uh, if you, have a, if you have the chance. The one call to action I do want to focus on um, that relates to uh, the church is call to action number 48. Uh, and the church's embrace actually of this call to action even, even um, before uh, its existence. So call to action number 48 calls on the church to formally adopt and comply with the principles, norms, st and standards of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a framework for reconciliation. The church has indicated through numerous statements its support for the rights expressed in the UNDRIP and throughout all of the UNDRIP, all of the rights come back to 
um, this inherent right that Indigenous peoples have to, to self-determination. And one of the statements that um, gives me a lot of hope and a lot of peace is one from uh, Pope John Paul II, now St. John Paul II, although at the time he was Pope, um, to the Native peoples of Canada uh, in Yellowknife in 1984 on one of his people visits to Canada. He said, today I want to proclaim that freedom which is required for a just and equitable measure of self-determination in your own lives as Native peoples. In union with the whole church, I proclaim all your rights and their corresponding duties. And I also condemn physical, cultural, and religious oppression and, that, and all that would in any way deprive you or any group of what rightly belongs to you. It is clearly the position of the church that peoples have a right in public life to participate in decisions affecting their lives. So in terms of uh, making reconciliation real, as the TRC pointed out, it is, it is a process, but there are um, some concrete actions that we can take. Um, so first is prayer, uh, pray for reconciliation. It's, it's, uh, it's a process that um, needs to be guided. And I think as Catholics, um, we, we should seek that guidance through our prayer. Uh, one thing I had I had thought about uh, was consider uh, making pilgrimages to uh, various religious sites, some of which Graydon had already mentioned, um, like St. Kateri's grave. Um, she's buried on the south side of uh, Montreal in Kahnawake, a Montreal or um, Mohawk uh, community. Uh, St. Joseph's Oratory in Montreal. St. Joseph, it's his year as well. It's coming to an end, but uh, St. Joseph is the patron saint of, of Canada. Um, and so even for me personally, uh, the reconciliation initiatives that I'm involved with, um, I've been asking, uh, I've, been, I've been interesting to, to him by virtue of his um, patronage of the country. And Rose Prince is great in, in, uh, in BC, which is, a, uh, so I've been to both St. Kateri and St. Joseph's Oratory, but Rose Prince's grave is a, a place I still have to go. And inform. Informing, uh, inform yourself of the history and legacy of residential schools and of Indigenous church and Indigenous state relations using um, resources such as the TRC report. Uh, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation has a repository of um, great resources. The Archdiocese of Toronto has put together a healing and reconciliation webpage that also uh, contains some really good information. There's also something called uh, the path, which really um, sort of goes, I think it's about a four hour training uh, sort of uh, module, various modules that go through um, the history of, of uh, Indigenous uh, state relations. Um, and I think it's important to inform ourselves on this history. Uh, one, because we, we live in this country and this is our history and it's something that we need to contend with. Um, and it's also, I think, every person's individual responsibility to inform them, inform themselves so that when they do come to conversations about reconciliation, or if you do hear something about um, a land, a land rights claim or a treaty negotiation in the news, you, you understand where that's coming from and that it's not just coming from thin air, but that <laughs> um, indigenous people's uh, grievances um, they have, they have a place and they have a, a long, long history in this country. And then solidarity. Um, so there's various uh, initiatives going on around, um, around this. So there's, there's been various expressions of solidarity, one being uh, the CCCB, which is the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishop, Bishops, which um, recently announced that They've pledged $30 million to fund uh, reconciliation initiatives uh, throughout the country. Um, so one thing that um, I would suggest is seek out opportunities to donate to this cause uh, in your respective diocese, if that's, if that's a possibility. Um, the CCCB is also developing prayer and educational materials um, that are indigenous focused, and that will be released beginning of uh, the Feast of Christ the King. 
Uh, there's also the uh, December 2021 visit to Rome, uh, where an Indigenous delegation will, will go to Rome to meet with the Holy Father over a course of a number of days. Um, and, I, and I think it will be a time for, for the Holy Father to re receive them and to listen to um, what, we've been, what we've been talking about uh, tonight, to listen to this history and to listen to this story. And I think um, it would actually, it's actually going to be um, sort of a good segue into uh, welcoming the Holy, the, the Holy Father uh, to Canada. Um, as some of you may have heard last week, the uh, Vatican announced that the Holy Father um, does plan to visit Canada at a date to be determined in the future. Um, whether or not he will issue a papal apology as the TRC has called for um, isn't clear yet, but um, I suspect, personally, I suspect that um, that will be something that's a part of his, a part of his, um, of his visit to Canada. Right. Oh, apologies. I think I had one more slide. I did, and it was question. <laughs> so I will hand it all over now to Father uh, Mark uh, to um, uh, moderate the Q and A period. Thank you so very much, Maria. Thank you so very much to all of our speakers for your presentations. It truly has given us a, a lot to think about um, on our path uh, to reconciliation. I now uh, invite Father Peter to animate our question and answer part of uh, the webinar. You can write your questions in the Q&A chat found at the bottom of your Zoom window. Now, Father Peter. Thank you, Father Mark. Um, just to start off, here's one question. I guess, uh, taking what you said uh, towards the end, Maria. So what is your hope? Uh, what do you hope will happen when the Pope comes to Canada? Is that a question for, for, for me or for Graydon? For both of you, it could be for both, yeah. Okay. So what, what is your hope? I, well, I, I kind of just expressed what, what I'm hoping for is um, uh, just, a time for um, us to be able to receive the Holy Father on, on Canadian soil. And I think him being in the place where these injustices were committed, um, that in of itself, I think will mean so much, uh, particularly to the survivors who have lived it and to um, their children or their grandchildren who have suffered the uh, intergenerational intergenerational effects uh, and trauma as a result of this of this history. I think his presence in and of itself um, is gonna is gonna is gonna be significant. Very good. Graydon? Well first of all I'm, I'm grateful that, that there's been a change I guess in uh, in the attitude of uh, invitation as well as the acceptance of the invitation. Uh, and um, I'm hoping he'll model the same thing that Pope John Paul II said in 1984, 1987, in which he reaffirmed indigenous people as human beings from the very beginning. And also secondly, that to also reinforce what was made by the pre predecessor Paul III back in 1537, which recognized indigenous people as human beings and having land rights. And uh, that uh, enculturation on Congo with St. Juan Diego by Our Lady Guadalupe. And uh, to me, that it's, uh, to me, I think it's Our Lady Guadalupe who's going to lead us into uh, the, this path of reconciliation for, for Indigenous Catholics or for Indigenous allies who are Catholics as well uh, to a better future. And, and I think that's what he will talk about because I'm sure he, he is going to apologize. Uh, uh, definitely, I mean, that's a high expectation. Uh, and I think maybe I'm hoping he'll be able to go more than just one area of our country because residential schools existed from Nova Scotia right to uh, right up to the Yukon. And so he, but, the, and I think it's important for the residential school survivors uh, to be assured by the Pope that all that happened was wrong. It was evangelization, 
that was imposed. It was wrong. Mm -hmm. Jesus is, is a man of faith. Jesus is a man of love. And when we open with that beautiful passage from Matthew, you can see what Jesus said. Go out. Go out and invite. So, and I think that's what he'll reinforce. Thank okay. you. All right. So here's another question for both of you. So, <laughs> uh, your experience now with the news that came out in the beginning of this year, and then your experience with, with, uh, with family and friends, like, uh, how did you kind of, how did your faith help you during that difficult time? And how is it helping you now deal with, with information as it comes out? Well, I think you're referring to 215 uh, yes. discovery of Mark Graves and, and Kamaloops. I yes. think it shocked everybody. It shocked me in terms of numbers because TRC had only said there were only 3,000 deaths uh, that were recorded. And then even in Kamaloops alone, they only said there were 91 deaths. And then all of a sudden, 215 graves are uncovered. And so that's a shock for everybody. And believe me, uh, but I'm a firm believer uh, in Jesus of being the healer, being the one who will look after us. And I look at these children as sad as it is as being angels in heaven right now. And uh, it's sad that the families of these children whose bodies are being uncovered did not have proper notice, which they should have given, should have been given so that they could mourn. So I think that's, that's, that's the way I, I pray for all these people. And as I related a little while ago, when I was in Fraser Lake, I didn't realize that was the highway of tears, where all those murdered, missing Indigenous women were. And the morning I was there, when I walked along that highway, and I recited my rosary, I recited my rosary for those people who were lost for, in whatever way. And so I'm a firm believer in prayer, and I think it's going to be prayer that's going to help us go toward it so that we'll go stronger. Even though the ugliness things are there, we don't want to see, but we have to. We have to do that. And that's the only way reconciliation can begin this process. Okay, Maria? Yeah, um, for me, like Graydon, and I think like the rest of the country, I was shocked um, by just even the sheer number. Because um, again, uh, the TRC, reported what it had information to report on. And uh, it turns out that there, there was more, um, which I think perhaps also speaks to um, the aggressiveness of the system um, in terms of how it was um, implemented, in terms of how it operated, um, in terms of how it viewed indigenous youth. Mm -hmm. Um, but in terms of my faith, um, I've been really trying to, um, hold very fast to it because I think I know on some interior level, it's hard to explain, um, that I can't get through this on my own or by myself or on my own strength. It's impossible. Um, and I take a lot of inspiration from those residential school survivors who have experienced immense trauma. Um, some of their stories I will never forget um, and who still hold very fast to their faith. And I think they have, by the grace of God, have worked on reconciliation within themselves. Because we talk about reconciliation in terms of Indigenous state relations and Indigenous church relations, kind of with these external parties, right? But it's also something that has to happen interiorly, too. Yeah. Um, so I take a lot of inspiration from them. If they can, if they can do it, I can do it, too. That's very good. Thank you. Okay, so now we talk about enculturation, and so Christianity elevating and purifying beautiful aspects of indigenous spiritualities. Do you have any concrete examples of that, that you and your families celebrate that uh, you, you would like to share with the rest of, with our listeners? Well, I can, um, I can speak to uh, one practice that uh, my family over the years has um, 
engaged engaged in more is uh, the practice of smudging. Mm -hmm. um, so I, for those of you who may not know what smudging is, um, it's when you take one of the sacred medicines, um, you, I usually use uh, sage, um, and you, you put it in, a, in uh, a bowl and you light it and you um, begin sort of like a purification process. Um, so it kind of is reflective of the incense that's used during adoration or solemn benediction within the church. Um, the, so the smoke as it, or the medicine as it burns, um, you offer your prayers to the creator um, in the same way that when the incense burns, it's the smoke going up is reflective of our prayers going up to, to heaven, right? Um, in, in the context of smudging, it's a similar, similar thing. It's a, it serves a similar purpose. Um, so when I smudge, my prayer is that, um, that the creator will help me to um, say the words that he wants me to say, this, to think the thoughts that he wants me to think, to see the world through his eyes that day and every day. Um, so for me, that's how um, I've been able to integrate my indigenous uh, spirituality within my Catholicism. Thank you. Graydon? Yeah, well, thank you very much for that wonderful question. But I think for myself, uh, I mean, I've, I, my wife and I prayed a rosary, but I can pray a rosary actually in my own indigenous language. So when you were a little, a little earlier today, you talked about in Mongolia where you were there and how the, our father had to change so many times. Mm -hmm. So in, in our particular language, uh, it's, it's got different meaning, different significance. And also when we pray to Hail Mary, we, we also pray that in a different way because of the cultural significance of women. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's, what, that's what we do, that's what I do. In funerals like we had when our son died in 2019, the funeral liturgy we had was in fact very strongly indigenous. We had our niece uh, do drumming and chanting and we had smudging and we made sure that the eagle feather was there and, and because the eagle is significant in, in our culture. And for those of you that are familiar reading the Bible, I would just say, read uh, Exodus uh, 19. Uh, and my eyes aren't too good here to see the verses, but I can tell you in there, Jesus reminds the Israelis who were fleeing from the Egyptians that the God hovered over them like an eagle. So you can see then how many passages in scripture there's reference to the eagle. And for our people, the eagle, or thunderbird as they have out west, for, for us, it's a significant reminder of the love of the creator to our people. So for those of us who will carry an eagle feather and have eagle feather ceremonies, that's very significant because that's part of our culture. That's part of our tradition. And also we, we do the same thing that uh, Maria talked about, sponging ceremonies. We also have pipe ceremonies. In fact, my mother was uh, one of the women from elders in our community who had, who had to teach the priest, the Franciscan, to say the mass in our language. And that was before the, before the mass itself was approved by Rome. But I remember the bishop who was there says, well, by the time they find out in Rome, it's gonna to be too late. But you can see then how enculturation is so significant for our people because of the way we have prayers. And you know, Peter, especially for the Western audience, if you go to uh, the Sacred Heart Church in the city of Edmonton, it's indigenous. And if you have an opportunity to go there and participate in the Eucharist, you're going to see how the indigenous aspects of spirituality are brought within the Catholic faith in that beautiful mass. I've had the privilege of being there a number of times. Similar things happened in uh, Manitoulin Island in Ontario, in Winnipeg, and uh, another church in uh, Mission, B.C., which is cheap. Where is it? Where, where it's uh, right in right in North Shore of BC, actually. North, I think they call it North Vancouver, that area, uh, where, they're, where they are. So I think our people are making those adoptions. And we have to make those adaptations in order for the message of Jesus to be, in fact, relevant to our people. And, you know, we refer to Jesus as our elder brother, mainly because the missionary says he was one of us. So if he's one of us, he must be an older brother. 
So the respect then of elders, you see, so that's very significant. So that's, that's what I do. That's what I promote. And, uh, and I think that's the way from the very beginning, very I good. consider Our Lady Guadalupe to be indigenous. That's what she told Juan Diego. That's great. So we're moving towards the season of Advent, right? So we close the year, the liturgical year with uh, Christ the King. And the first thing that comes to mind, Gabe, it's a season of hope. So it's one of the questions that we have and how hope fuels, right? It informs our lives as Catholics. And then I think of the nativity crash and I've seen many beautiful ones, indigenous ones from around the world and that can really represent again and uh, allow the beauty of, of the respective cultures to, to, uh, to, to present, right? To present the, the incarnate Christ in a way that uh, reflects the, uh, the individual culture. So keeping that in mind, now, what can we do? So Maria, you've given us uh, some excellent suggestions. So of course, prayer, uh, there's ways of contributing. What can local churches, I'm not talking about, sorry, the, the Archdiocese of Toronto per se, because there are initiatives that are taking place, but what can Holy Rosary do? What can St. Thomas Aquinas um, do? What can St. John Henry Newman do? What can St. Clair of Assisi do? What can um, like the Canadian, like there's so many, many churches uh, individually, what can we do uh, to, to be a place of healing and reconciliation and dialogue, effective dialogue? Um, so I would say, uh, depending on the individual needs of each parish and ability uh, and capacity, et cetera, um, organizing even like book readings or discussions or study groups, that's that sort of thing. So that we're not we're not um, doing all of this labor necessarily on our own. Like yes, you have to do the work of reading and, and researching and that sort of thing, but um, to have a space in which you can then discuss, I think is really important. Um, as someone who for most of my post-secondary education um, has been studying these issues for now over 10 years, um, I didn't have that really. I didn't have a whole lot of, aside from like classes and tutorials, I didn't have really um, spaces where I could discuss these issues and particularly Catholic spaces where I could discuss these issues. Um, I really struggled really struggled with that. Um, so I think uh, providing those opportunities for genuine dialogue with other Catholics, um, I think is important. Okay, so there's a, there's a, a comment. Uh, they're asking if you can stop screen sharing so they can see you better. So if that's okay. <laughs> so there's a lot of, there's a, here's an interesting, many, many good questions here. And one of them, is, there's a suggestion. I'm just trying to, let me just find this here again. So the suggestion is that people out in, if you're in BC to make, to encourage visitors to Vancouver to visit UBC and honor the reconciliation pole carved by Jim Hunt. Uh, can any one of you comment on that? Uh, well, I'll, I've heard about it and I think, first of all, artists, are very spiritual people. Mm -hmm. And so I think when they carve something that's significant that from their spiritual background, be it okay. indigenous or non-indigenous, I think it's always worth it to see. Uh, I mean, for especially for the people who live out in Vancouver, if they can visit UBC and it's a beautiful university, it's large, and there are some good indigenous people there. There's a beautiful longhouse that they have and it's captured in, in the different totem poles that are there as well. And there's it's a very vibrant uh, community in UBC. <clears throat> and I would say, yes, go see works of arts that indigenous people have created to because it's a spiritual gift that's being offered to society in general. That's what that's how I would respond. Uh, if I'm ever out in BC again at the, in Vancouver and uh, UBC, uh, I, I will go see it myself. I haven't seen it yet, but there's also a very strong uh, uh, Catholic presence in St. Mark's, St. Mark's. Uh, College and St. Mark's uh, Church there. They're very, very strong and in indigenous uh, that's there because I've been there a number of times. 
But if you go to the Squamish First Nation in Vancouver North, that was the very first Catholic church in all of British Columbia. It's called Mission. But I think if the people in that area of uh, Vancouver want to go see, and they are praying in their own language right now. And so I've been there a couple of years ago. And uh, so, oh, yes, by all means, do it. You see, because this path of reconciliation is not going to be an easy one. And it's, I think, as Maria has said, it's not going to be done next year. It's going to take a while. We've had over 250 years of suppression, 250 years of first beginning that Jesus is one of you. And now, wait a minute, now we don't like the way you pray. So we're going to make you pray the way we were taught. So they, we've got to undo over 150 years of that kind of uh, unfortunate face of evangelization. So it's going to take a long while. And our people are deeply divided. That, so should they remain Catholic or not? And my suggestion is yes, you know, because we have a beautiful Eucharistic celebration in which we, in fact, can offer our pain and our struggles at the time of deconsecration, at the time, and it's a special part of our Mass. And I say, offer your pain, offer your sorrows, offer your struggles to Jesus on that altar. And through prayer, as well as our own religious way of praying, we can begin to get healed. It, it, it's something that is required of everybody within the Catholic faith. And for the non-Indigenous Catholics who are out there, you know, we've been here for centuries and centuries and centuries. We're not going to go away. Uh, I think uh, treat us as brothers and sisters in the family of Jesus. Thank you. Uh, another question with regards to the, the path. So, Maria, you mentioned the path as... Um one of the opportunities for, for uh, working towards reconciliation. Now, is this, is it possible for anyone, I'm just reading here, to enroll for this, in this module? So I know that it was developed for um, uh, legal professionals, okay. at least originally, um, but there may be, I'm, I'm not one of the organizers for it, <laughs> but there may be, um, a way to to access it if um, uh, to a, like it, there may be a way to make it more accessible to a broader audience. Okay. Um, but I'm not uh, I'm not sure um, who would be the contact person on that. Okay. There's another very uh, important question and a very complicated question with regards to the return of land and how does that uh, factor into reconciliation. You know, it's a very, it's, a, it's, a, I'm not sure how, like, what, what uh, angle you want to take on that. Like, how do you want to approach the question? But it, what do you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'll go first on this one. I mean, I've been, I've been a lawyer since 1971 and sure. uh, the struggle for Aboriginal title, which was in British Columbia with the, the Niska up in the Nass Valley, which would have began and finally, in 1973, the Supreme Court of Canada recognized the concept of Aboriginal title. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that the, the provincial regulations could not suppress the, the existence of Indigenous people in those particular areas. And that has also been reinforced by the Supreme Court of Canada in just a few years ago. And so the struggle for Indigenous land, like for example, what's happening right here in British Columbia, there's a major lawsuit that's because the peace and friendship okay. treaties that were signed here in the East Coast, mm -hmm. there was never a land surrender. There was never a territory to, to, the, to the particular Europeans, well, the French or the English were here. And so now all of a sudden there's this case, which is, uh, which is the province is actually telling the people don't, they don't want their public servants to participate in land acknowledgement. This is how foolish and ridiculous it's getting. The courts will ultimately decide this particular question. It's not going to be a political thing, but th that is what's what's wrong with recognizing there are people here. I mean, our son, who was an archaeologist in this province, worked for the province of New Brunswick, mm -hmm. but the oldest artifact is 14,000 years old. That's a long time ago, believe me. That's good. <laughs> and I always used to tell my son, we've been here since time immemorial. So once they perfect this, how long we've been here, that's the creator put us on this territory, on these lands. 
and made us who we are. And so I think that is ultimately what will have to eventually be determined. Uh, it's a big legal struggle, but there are other areas in Quebec, for example, where there are no treaties. And so they're going to have to come to terms sometimes what's happening in New Brunswick. The same thing is with Newfoundland. And there are still major parts of British Columbia where there is still Aboriginal title. It just has not an in the north, you know. So, so those things are real. And, and in our particular um, philosophy, I guess, if I could say that, uh, Father Peter, we say the creator put us on this land on Mother Earth. And so we're asked not only as stewards, but to make sure that seven generations head our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren will also have the same relationship with the land as our ancestors and we do. So that's a big message, you know, and, and, and our people are not going to kick people out. That's never been, you know, in New Brunswick here, when I, when I talk to people about, well, are they going to remove us or something? I said, look, when Samuel the Champlain came to New Brunswick, well, the Bay of Fundy in 1604 mm -hmm. and said, okay, I'm claiming this on behalf of the King of France, well, what did he do? But the thing is, that particular winter, he and his crew had to winter in St. Croix Island, which isn't far from St. Andrews and St. Stephen and in and, and Maine. And if it was not the Passamaquoddy tribe, who are, we're the same family of nations there, who did not provide them with medicine, with food, with water, believe me, they would all been dead. And so a lot of people forget that if it wasn't for Indigenous people who helped the early people who came here, they would not have survived because they didn't know where the food came from. They didn't know where there was fresh water. They didn't know how to survive the weather and all that. So you can't forget that. You can't take an eraser and clear the board and say, okay, that's happened so long. We're going to bring a new uh, electronic, electronic board now and different things. Our people have been here. They're not going to go away. And uh, no matter what happens. and But we are not vindictive. We don't want people to go. That's never been our tradition. That's not our philosophy. That's not our spirituality. Thank you very much. Maria, did you want to comment as well? Yeah, I would just say, thank you for that, Graydon. Um, well said. Um, I would just say that uh, in terms of dealing with land grievances, like in law, the preferred means of dealing with it is through negotiation, uh, particularly treaty negotiations. Um, but those uh, processes can take a very, very long time. Um, so for example, I went to law school at the University of Ottawa. Oftentimes when a land acknowledgement is done in Ottawa, it's said that Ottawa is situated on the unceded territory of the Algonquin people. And that is a treaty that has been in negotiation for like 25 plus years. So while we have these um, processes in place to help address these land grievances, they're not, as I said before, reconciliation is not something that is going to happen overnight. It's not gonna to happen tomorrow. It may not even happen in our generation, okay. but it is something that needs to happen. That is the point. It's okay. took us generations to get here and it's gonna take us generations to get out of here too. We hope that, that we hope and pray and do everything we can for that to, to, to come to fruition. There's one more comment here. And so this is from uh, Maria. And she says that she would also recommend seeing Leland Bell's Stations of the Cross in the Church of the Immaculate Conception on Manitoulin Island. So there's another place of, uh, of pilgrimage as well. So thank you for these great questions. Father Mark. Yes, once again, uh, thank you uh, to uh, all of our speakers. Your faith is uh, truly inspiring. Thank you for your knowledge and thank you, thank you for taking the time uh, to uh, talk to each and every one of us. There was a lot of information given to us in this webinar. Uh, that is why uh, let us now bring all of it together by praying to our Creator. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for joining our webinar. I hope uh, this was uh, helpful to you. The Newman Center in Toronto also offers Faith and Reason lectures, which we invite you to join. Our next lecture is titled, A uh, Mind of at Peace, Reclaiming an Ordered Soul in an Age of Distraction by Joshua Hoshield. 
I hope to see you there. God bless you all. Thank you once again.